Hey there, this is Steve Lee with Veritas Catholic Network. We have another treat for you today on Let Me Be Frank. Deacon Greg Kandra, the creator and writer of the Deacon's Bench blog and author of several spiritual and devotional books, is spending the hour talking with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Do not turn your dial away from 1350 AM and stay tuned in throughout the whole week. You can listen also anytime on your phone using uh, the Veritas Catholic Network app. And there you can live stream our broadcast, grab podcasts of our shows on demand. Uh, Make sure you get that app. It's on the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store. It's also at www.veritascatholic.com. We are bringing the truth to Connecticut and New York. So when you're tired of listening to noise on the radio, put on Veritas and be fed. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank, everybody. It is my great pleasure, as always, to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, good morning to you. How are you today? Doing great, Excellency, and um, and thank you. How are you doing? I'm okay. Yeah, I'm getting ready for my first plane trip. Oh, where are you going? Legatus to Ann Arbor, Michigan. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's my first foray into an airport, so it was nice knowing you. <laughs> 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 I think they said it's supposed to be pretty safe. Um, in fact, <laughs> our, um, our our guest on today, he's he's recently flown, and so he can tell you. Yes, we have absolutely. it's been fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. We have Deacon Greg Kendra on with us. Deacon is the creator of the blog The Deacon's Bench, which has garnered over twenty million readers from around the world since its inception in two thousand seven. He's the author of two devotional books about the living gospel, um, and he's the author of two books of spiritual reflections, Busy Person's Guide to Prayer and a Bu- The Busy Person's Guide to an Extraordinary Life. And that's not even mentioning the long career, career he had in broadcast journalism, most of that time at CBS News, where he was a writer and producer for several programs, including 48 Hours, 60 Minutes 2, Sunday Morning, and the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric. And he is the author, most recently, of a book that's coming out from Ave Maria Press called A Deacon Praise. Deacon Greg Kendra, welcome to Let Me Be Frank. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here, and it's great to connect once again with Bishop Frank. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Deacon Kendra, it is so good to be with you again. It has you know, we know each other for a very long time from our days in Brooklyn, at least my days in Brooklyn. And um, <laughs> yeah. you, you, are one of, you have had such a fascinating career. So that's my first question, because I have the benefit of knowing you, but our listeners don't. So give us a sense of your, your life journey has, and how that brought you to the diaconate. But first, your life journey in, in general, because it's such a fascinating story. Oh, yeah. I grew up outside Washington, D.C. and majored in journalism. And I had the misfortune of graduating college in the middle of the last Great Recession, and there were no jobs in journalism to be had. But somehow, uh, through my parents' connections, I got a job as a secretary at CBS News in Washington, answering phones and, uh, and typing scripts on big IBM Selectric typewriters. Uh, which was the best learning experience in the world. And from that, I eventually took the writing test because I wanted very much to be a writer. And they transferred me up to CBS Radio in New York, where I got to write for people like Charles Corrault and Charles Osgood. And then eventually segued into television. And um, my wife and I got, we moved uh, to New York shortly after we were married in 1986. And it's been an incredible journey uh, working with some of these giants in journalism and in, in television news. And uh, eventually what led me to the diaconate was my experience of 9-11. Working, uh, Tell uh, us about that. Tell us about that. Very close to that, yes. Um, you know, being in New York when that happened was just an overwhelming experience. And the day the towers fell on 9-11, I ended up really working until one o'clock the next morning, writing special reports and watching those towers fall again and again and again. And Mm. I remember so vividly uh, 
early, very early, 2 o'clock on September the 12th, walking. CBS put us up in hotels to keep us overnight because there was no way to leave the city. So we, I walked with a group of people across midtown Manhattan, which was pitch black. All the lights were off. All the stoplights were just blinking. There was a, a soldier on every street corner. And I remember crossing Broadway. We were going over to 6th Avenue and looking down about 10 blocks south of us and seeing Times Square, and it was pitch black. All the lights had been turned off, and it was the first time that it happened since World War II because they were so concerned about another attack. Anyway, uh, life somehow went on after that day, and it really made me look more closely at my life and what I had done with my life, where I had been, uh, where I was going. I was relatively young. I was 42, I think, at the time. And I had pretty much achieved everything that I wanted in my career in television. And like the old Peggy Lee song, I was asking myself, is that all there is? And I found myself circling back to my faith and becoming more and more interested in connecting more with my faith. And I discovered the writings of Thomas Merton and made a retreat to a Trappist monastery and... The rest is history. I just uh, became more and more interested in in that life. I thought for a while of becoming a lay Cistercian or a third order Trappist. And then one day uh, they invited me down to attend a conference of other lay Cistercians, and one of the people there was a deacon. And I had only the vaguest idea of what a deacon was. At that time, we didn't have one at our parish in Forest Hills, but um, I was just blown away uh, listening to him. He, he preached the homily in three different languages, French, English, and Spanish. He was from England, but living in France. And I sought him out after to talk to him. Something just said to me, this is something you should look into. And I found out that he was also a broadcaster. He worked for the BBC in London. And oh, wow. CBS has a long history with the BBC. And it turned out we knew a lot of the same people. And the hair was standing up on the back of my neck. And I thought, there's something to this. And I said to him, you know, uh, maybe I should consider the diaconate. And he said in a great British accent, oh, you'd be great. You should be a deacon. You'd be wonderful. <laughs> and uh, so I went back and the, the rest is history. This was in the spring of 2002. And uh, it was that summer that I applied. Um, and I started in, in the fall of, of 2002. And it's so funny because I talked to guys, and there are men who discern this for years and years and years, whether or not this is something they want to do or should do. And for me, it was just a matter of weeks. It was just, you know, the Holy Spirit came and whapped me upside the head, and, and here I am. Well, see, I t that's a remarkable story, and there is no chance and coincidence in life. So that deacon was there for the very purpose, I think, of instilling what was, well, bringing to the surface what was already instilled in your heart, that this was the calling um, that the Lord gave you. It's remarkable. I, I like, and of course, your so. skills, yeah. right? Your skills as a journalist um, make you an excellent homilist, if I must say so myself, and an, obviously an excellent writer. And... For us, for those of us who are clerics, communicating the gospel effectively is one of our prime directives, right? It's one of our most important ministries. So if I were to ask you, Greg, what, um, how did your training as a journalist help you uh, in your ministry as a deacon? And most especially in the blog that you created, which I want you to give a, a, a bit of an of a overview to our listeners. How, does, how did that background actually, in fact, help your ministry when you became a deacon? Well, it's, it's funny because the desire to preach was one of the things that attracted me to the, to the diaconate mm -hmm. and to try and use some of the skills that I had learned at CBS and bring them into the pulpit, as it were. Mm -hmm. And it's really, um, fundamentally, it's, it's storytelling. It's taking people on this journey and, and capturing their imagination and holding their interest. And as a priest 
told me, he gave me some advice uh, when I was ordained. He said, just remember to keep it real. And I really tried to do that. I, I tried to keep it concrete and explicit. And one of the things I, I've noticed when uh, I usually write out my homilies, I don't just deliver them. And I tend to, to write the way that I wrote for broadcasting in short, you know, concise sentences, sentence fragments. Uh, I write for the ear, uh, which I think is something a lot of people don't quite grasp when you preach that you're, you're writing to be heard. And I think that's important. So um, taking all of that together, uh, I think, has, has helped me immensely. And the blog really started right after I was ordained. I took a couple of weeks off and became a, a church rat and hung around the, the rectory and the church, and I served a lot of the daily masses. And at that time, I was the editor of Katie Couric's blog at CBS. So I knew a little bit about blogging, and I knew also that there were no blogs out there really by or for deacons. So more or less on a whim, I started this thing, uh, which I called the Deacon's Bench, with the idea of chronicling my first days as a deacon. And I could also post some of my homilies and, you know, really look at the church from, from this new perspective. And part of what I try to do is remind people that we are a big church, that it encompasses a lot of different voices and a lot of different temperaments and a lot of different types of orthodoxies. And that we're all part of this. And so I try to focus as much as I can on the, the full spectrum of what it means to be Catholic, uh, from people who love the Latin Mass to people who love guitar masses. And it's, you know, we're all in this together. So um, that's really what that's about. And it's a lot of posting news and information about the diaconate and about the church and just things that I find interesting. You know, your insight that a preaching is essentially storytelling um, is quite profound because when you look at the Lord's preaching, much of it, much of the parables, for example, are stories of his contemporary life that I'm sure would have grabbed the attention of his listeners, as they do even us now, 21 centuries later, and impart basic truths, right? So you, the whole idea, I think, unless you disagree, would be to give something left to think over long after the homily is gone, right? Um, gives something to chew over, to reflect, to apply in your life. So um, I try to do the same in my preaching. I'm not always as effective, but I do try. And sometimes I struggle with maintaining, so I'm asking you this for your opinion, uh, maintaining um, some, uh, a balance between storytelling, whether it's stories about other individuals or even stories of my own life, um, as an entree without it becoming the absolute focus of what you're talking about. In other words, if a person only remembers the story and not whatever other spiritual theological point you're trying to make, I think you, you lost the battle. So have you had that struggle in your, in your uh, ministry, Greg? Do oh, yeah, there's, there always has to be a point. <laughs> sure. Um, it's not just a story for a story's sake. And mm -hmm. in fact, there are sometimes uh, back in the days when I used to take the subway or the bus into work every day, which now I'm working from home, but I'd spend the mornings sometimes on the commute, you know, reading through the paper or uh, reading mm -hmm. the, the news on my cell phone. And a story would jump out at me and really move me. And I would say to myself, I've got to find a way to work this into my homily for this week. How does this connect to next Sunday's scripture? Something in this is really touching me and affecting me. And I want to bring that to other people. What is it that's doing that? Mm -hmm. So part of it is, is finding that connection and the link between what's happening in the world and what's happening in the scriptures that week or what's happening in the church and mm -hmm. connecting people to that in hopefully an, an inspiring and memorable way. Uh, but yeah, there, there's always got to be a, a bigger purpose behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, do you sense that your preaching has changed all these years? Has it evolved in any way? Um, a little bit. 
it, it's gotten harder. <laughs> you well, know, the more you do why it, the more you, you look for. Yeah, why is that, you think? You, you know, you keep looking for fresh ideas and fresh approaches and different ways of looking at it. And of course, as we grow and as we change as people, different things mm -hmm. from the scriptures hit us in different ways. Um, I'm a, a big believer in Lexio and using that as sort of the launching pad for, for what I want to preach about. And sometimes I will read the same scripture three years later and a different phrase or a different sentence will leap out at me that didn't leap out at me three years earlier when I last preached on it. And part of that is discerning within myself. What is it that's speaking to me now that, <laughs> that I think people need to hear from this? Right. And why is this resonating with me now? Um, right. So it's, it's, it takes a little, mm -hmm. little more time and discernment. When I was brand new at this, every week was new and fresh and interesting, and it, it was like falling off a log sometimes. Uh, and I was also very blessed in many ways with my pastor, <clears throat> the late Monsignor Fanaro, who asked me to preach pretty much every week. So I had that discipline of, or that challenge of, of finding something to say every week, uh, even if I didn't have anything to say, <laughs> to find a way to, to bring the gospel alive. Right. So that was very good discipline for me also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I have found? I, I've mentioned this in previous um, times we were together, you know, for the podcast and other reflections, but I have found in my life many times, perhaps most times, I am preaching to myself first. And yes. Yes. My preaching is, is a mirror into my own spiritual life. And the issue, just like you said, the issues that are obviously I'm reflecting on or the issues that are concerning me or the things I'm struggling with, um, your, your insight about the scriptures, there are items in the scriptures, there's insights that come to you at a certain season in your life that did not occur perhaps 10 years before. It's just so true. Like this Easter, I am fascinated in my prayer, and I'm not exactly sure why, with this notion of Jesus inviting or not inviting people to touch him. So Thomas was invited to touch him. Mary Magdala was told, don't touch me. This, this now coming mm. Sunday, right? we hear that the Lord invites them again. I'm, a, I'm not a ghost. Touch me. See, I'm eating. So to why, to some, yes, touch, and others, particularly Mary Magdalene, do not touch me. Do, and that never struck me before in all these years. And now suddenly it's, it's something I pray over. So it's so true. It's the scriptures and mirror into your soul. Let me ask you this. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. What aspect of diaconate um, have... D do you enjoy the most? Which is the one that has changed the most? Which is the one that you struggle the most? You could take that any way you wish, Greg. Well, I, I love having the opportunity to preach. Um, mm -hmm. I love doing baptisms. It's the most joyful part of my ministry. Um, you know, it's of, of all the different liturgical things that deacons get to do, uh, it's... Uh, it's the most rewarding, and particularly now when we're, you know, trying to emerge out of COVID, we went for a long time being very limited on what we were able to do with baptisms and some of the other liturgies, and it's been so meaningful to people to be able to have their children baptized, even in small groups, even having to wear masks and all the restrictions that we have in place, and that's been incredibly gratifying, and to see up close and personal how much the faith means to them the sacrifices and the compromises that they're willing uh, to make to, um, to bring their children into the church is, is really beautiful to me and very moving. And it's, it's rare that I, I baptize a child and I'm not moved myself saying the words of, of baptism and seeing the look on the parents' faces. It's, it's really something to see. Um, it, it can be very challenging, I think, to... Uh, coordinate my schedule. Uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about time management when I was mm -hmm. in formation, and that is still uh, one of the big 
you know, juggling acts that I have. Uh, mm -hmm. I've often compared Deacons to being like the plate spinner on the Ed Sullivan show, trying to keep all the plates going without anything falling. And that, that's, that can be rough and it can be exhausting sometimes. But the Holy Spirit, the grace of holy orders somehow makes it happen. And what we can't do, the Holy Spirit and the Lord make up the difference, right? Because you do, you do a lot Absolutely. of speaking, do you not? Talks and 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 because you spoke for us on communication, which was extraordinarily well received. You do a lot of traveling around the country pre-COVID and perhaps, please God, post-COVID. Yeah, back back in the old days, I did, and I loved that. I did a lot of it for my job with Catholic Near East Welfare Association, uh, my day job, uh, traveling around and giving pulpit talks in different parts of the country, and I love doing that not just because I love the opportunity to get up and speak, but I love seeing the church in other parts of the country and in other parts of the world and seeing that there's a world out there beyond Brooklyn that is, is a little bit now, different. wait a minute now. And, wait a uh, minute. What was that? What did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's not heresy. No heresy on this show. <laughs> <laughs> No, I understand your point. Forgive it's, me, it, for, it, it, forgive me, Father. No, Can I do a confession here my now? Son, you are forgiven. <laughs> no, but Greg, it's, you know, you again. It's I've traveled too. You know, I've done my fair share. It's fascinating, even in the United States, how the church, the lived experience, is so different in different parts of the church, right? One of the most moving experiences I had, I, I spoke at a parish in Iowa, near Quad Cities, Iowa. And it was a little tiny parish. It was one priest, and he did everything. God bless him. And I remember I helped give out communion. Every single person, it's the only parish I can think of where this has happened. Every single person who came up to receive communion received in the hand. There, were no one, there was no one who received on the tongue. But the hands were calloused. These were farmers and factory workers. And I was so humbled by that. It, it was it was beautiful. Mm. You know, when we were growing up, it, it, growing up, being formed, but actually growing up in the seminary, there was a, a saying, you've heard it many times, uh, which I do not like, but I will say anyway, um, the guys would joke and look at their hands and say, these hands are for chalices, not calluses. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. But, but your insight is far more profound Right. Because if you don't have those callous, whatever it is, that that mm. basic humility and in the in the in the stuff of life, then I'm not sure you can hold a chalice up worthily, in my humble opinion. But that's neither here nor there. Um, so you will be a, a deacon. How many years now? Will it be 20 years next year? Oh, Good grief. No, it was uh, 2007 I was ordained. Oh, 2007. I uh, so it'll be 15 years next year. Four, four, 14 years? It'll be 14 years this year in May. This year. Uh, May 19th. 15th, right. Right. Wow. Uh, we so, were uh, Nick DiMarzio's uh, first class. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, of course. And I was director of the Acne. Now, well, I, Greg, forgive me because, you know, my life, my mind's, you know, it's early senility, but I was director <laughs> of the diaconate. Uh, did we, uh, was I director of the diaconate when you started formation? Or had, uh, had the bishop already removed? It was Monsignor home? Wetterer. Right. No, it was Monsignor Wetterer for the first Who semester the of aspirancy, and then they passed the torch to you to you and right. uh that was still when you were when when you were plain old father frank and oh, the uh good old then days. you took off like a rocket and <laughs> <laughs> the days of saint dominic's to... remember bishop oh, carney saint... high school and all oh, of that of course of course <laughs> but you know what greg i have to tell you my years <laughs> in the diaconate i've said this before they were the happiest years of my life in ministry because I've met remarkable people, yourself included in that list, uh, who have enriched my life, enriched the church, have served countless people in ministry. Those really were. I mean, it, it's, it's funny. You, 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 uh, your leadership changes. My leadership role has changed. 
Um, and with it comes other challenges, but um, those years at St. Dominic's, the years in the diaconate, gosh, they were, they were some great times. Great times. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here um, and because uh, and, we need to take a break. So uh, let me just let everyone know, you're listening to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. It sounds like you're listening to two old friends because clearly Bishop Frank is a longtime friend of our guest, the uh, well-known speaker and author, Deacon Greg Kandra. And we'll take a short break and we'll be right back. Catholic Radio Works, and now we have it here in Connecticut and New York. It's been seen around the country that there's no better tool for evangelization. Where there's Catholic Radio, the folks who listen deepen their faith. Families are strengthened, parishes and communities flourish. So, let people know you're listening to Veritas, tell your friends to tune in, and let's make an impact here for Jesus and His Church. This is Steve Lee for Veritas Catholic Network. Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano on the Veritas Catholic Network. We're picking up on a conversation between Bishop Frank and Deacon Greg Kandra, the creator of the blog, The Deacon's Bench, and author most recently of A Deacon Praise. Excellency? Yes, yeah, so you know what, uh, Deacon Greg, so therefore let's pivot and let's dive into the whole gift, um, discipline of prayer. Okay. So I come from outer space, and I meet you, and I ask you a question. Uh, what is prayer? How, how would you define, explain, illustrate for me this, this gift of prayer? I like to go back to, uh, I think it was St. Teresa of Avila, who said prayer should be like a conversation with a friend. We tend... I think, to get very hung up on prayer and feel that it has to be formalized and it has to be specific words at specific times addressed, you know, in a specific way, whether it's on our knees or in a church or wherever. And one of the things that I sort of used for my springboard in this book is, you know, St. Paul saying, uh, pray without ceasing. Well, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. And you do that, I think, by making everything in your life a kind of prayer. Preparing a meal can be a prayer. I, I, in my book on uh, The Busy Person's Guide to Prayer, I talk about Brother Lawrence and how he used to pray in the kitchen. Um, anything done with a specific intention can be a kind of prayer and a kind of communication with God and an offering to God. And I think we need to keep that in our hearts um, it's not just the words you say, but it's the things that you do and how you do them and why you do them. I have loved visiting uh, Trappist monasteries and going on retreat, and they follow the Benedictine rule, ora e labora, work in prayer. So they, you know, they pray for a little while, and then they go and work for a little while, and then they go back and pray for a little while, and then they work for it. And it's back and forth and back and forth. And after a while, I think the two things really sort of mesh together. And work becomes prayer, and prayer becomes a part of your work. Um, and I think that's a beautiful way to live if you can keep your heart and mind in that direction. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it sounds as if um, prayer without ceasing is a disposition, right? It's, it's an attitude towards everything and everyone around you. Um, it's to be able, in some way, to perceive God's presence in the most ordinary moments and be able to name him wherever he is. Exactly. And right. Would you agree? Yeah. Uh, finding God in all things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it is. So then how do you distinguish the, that posture in life to a more formal prayer when you are on your knees or in church? Um, talk, talk to us about how both are, part, are central parts of life and how, how they fit together. Yeah, I think they, they kind of complement each other. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mentioned in uh, the introduction to um, 
to my book, which you very graciously wrote the, the foreword to, A Deacon Praise. Who's I mentioned a, 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 a deacon candidate who I met. Oh, oh well, thank you for, uh, for being a part of it and giving your imprimatur. Uh, but I mentioned a deacon candidate that I met. He was a deacon uh, in, candidate in the Diocese of Brooklyn, and he had just started his formation. And I asked him how it was going, and he was very excited about it. And he said, but it's been really hard learning how to pray. And doing the liturgy, the hours and, and whatnot. And he said, I'm someone who prays with my hands, meaning I pray with what I do. He's very active in his parish and very busy. And this is forcing me to think of praying in a different way, praying on my knees and praying more intentionally with, with the scripture. And I, I thought that was really interesting. And it, it shows that divide that you're talking about, the two different types of prayer. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of us, um, some people find it more comfortable and more familiar to pray on their knees in church, and they don't realize that there is another whole aspect of prayer, the one that I, I spoke about earlier. And I think the challenge is to blend the two and, and to be comfortable with the two. And that's something that this deacon candidate was discovering. But... I think even when you are in church and even when you are doing a more formalized kind of prayer, we should strive to make it as personal as possible and to speak from our heart as much as possible. One time mm -hmm. when I was on retreat at one of these monasteries, uh, the priest offered some insight about praying the Psalms uh, with the monks. And he said, remember that you are praying with Jesus and you were praying the same words that he prayed when he prayed to his father. And that really brought it home to me, and it's something I've always remembered, that these are not just words in a book, that these are words that are inscribed in the heart of Christ and that he lived with and that he carried with him. And when we pray, try to imagine praying with him. Uh, it's, it's very humbling and very beautiful. Mm. You know, it, it just reminds me of a... a, a a story in my own life, you mentioned St. Dominic's. And I remember my, it was either first or second Easter that I was at St. Dominic's. And, you know, the, the natural inclination is you want everything perfect and everything beautiful and everything clean and everything organized. And I mean, when it was all over, and we do that in all our parishes, we, we want the very best for our people. And I was so proud of myself because nothing collapsed. We didn't burn the church down. Everything worked great. People <laughs> seemed happy. I was really, I thought, say, wow, this is great. And I went to see my spiritual director, and it was like getting hit by a two by four because I'm going on about it. I did this, I did that, I cleaned, we did this, and we shined all the brass and blah, 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 and all the rest. And to your point, he says to me, that sounds really wonderful. He said, um, uh, Were you praying? When did you pray? And I thought to myself, do you have another question to ask me? <laughs> do I have to answer this one? <laughs> <laughs> because I got the point. But you see, even at that point in my priesthood, hearing what you're saying now, in fact, with the right disposition, that is a form of prayer. If you keep your intention mm. and disposition correct, right? Uh, it prevents it from being just busy work or show or, or, or theater. That's not what we're doing here. So y even in my life, which is you, what you're suggesting, was a lesson I had to learn the hard way, right? So for those who are listening to our podcast, if they say, well, I'm nowhere near that, that's quite all right. We, that's what life is all about, right, to keep learning. Um, if I were to ask you then... Uh, I come to you and say, Deacon Kendra, I just have a difficult time settling my mind, my spirit. Um, I get easily distracted when I do my formal prayers. And even in the ordinariness of life, you know, I want to see the Lord's presence, but, you know, I go wandering. I, you know, my mind's in a thousand different places. And, and so I can't focus. If I came to you seeking some guidance or advice, what would you, what could you offer? Like, what would you say? Well, one of the things I suggest in my book is is to start small. 
Um, even if you start with just an Our Father at the beginning of the day and a Hail Mary at the end of the day or something like that, to sort of focus your mind and to give you that few moments of, of reflection and, and prayerful conversation with God. And it will make a difference. Even starting with something that simple and that small can reap benefits. And I tell people, you know, when they get, <laughs> when they get bored uh, doing the rosary, for example, um, just start with one decade and, and take it from there and make little baby steps. You know, I think about um, one of the advice, when, when they teach circus performers how to juggle, you start with one ball and then you go to two and then you go to three. Start with that one ball. Start with that one mm -hmm. prayerful moment that you can have and build on that and learn mm -hmm. to get that right or at least mm -hmm. try mm -hmm. and take it from there and be patient with yourself and ask God to, to be with you and the Holy Spirit to be with you. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll work eventually. It really will. Mm -hmm. You, you spoke of Lexio as something that has been a very important part of your life in prayer. Um, would you recommend that for our listeners? And if so, what practical advice could you give in that regard? Well, yeah, this is something else that I think some people overlook as a form of prayer, which is praying with the scriptures, reading the scriptures and reflecting on what you're reading. Um, putting yourself into the story, something the Jesuits are very good at, um, making, seeing how it relates to your own life, and not necessarily reading a whole chapter of the Bible. Again, start small, and look at individual phrases as you're reading it, the same way that I reflect on it if I'm, I'm working on a homily, is see what leaps out at you, and think about it and, and ask yourself why. Why does this particular phrase or this particular passage of Scripture speak to me now? And what is it saying that I need to pay attention to? And spending a few minutes doing that can, can be wonderfully rewarding. Uh, do you have one or a few favorite passages in Scripture that you, you know, go back to periodically? Oh, my, my absolute favorite uh, from Revelation, Behold, I make all things new. I, uh, that's always stuck with me, and I remember it so vividly, as you probably do too, in, in the Passion of the Christ. Oh, Jesus yes. says that to his mother as he's carrying the cross. Um, what an incredible moment, and an incredible way of using that line of Scripture. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that's always stuck with me. For, for my, for for me, it's it has always what resonates deeply is the 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 raising of Lazarus, because it's such a poignant moment in mm. the Lord's ministry. Um, untie him, and let him go free. And I think that is mm. very much what discipleship is: to be untied from sin, from what binds us, and and, and to go free, to find the freedom that comes from faith in Christ and perseverance in the Spirit and the confidence that comes with that, which doesn't mean that your life is going to be easy, but we know where we're going, right? We know where we're going. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, all of us in, in one way or another are Lazarus, and all of us have, <laughs> are bound in some way. And mm -hmm. that, that passage has so many... Uh, so many meanings for so many of us. Yeah, which is true of all scripture, right? As you said before. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in your ministry now, um, what aspect now that you're involved with that you find um, may open a new vista? Because obviously you are an accomplished preacher an accomplished writer, you're an excellent teacher, and communication is your background. So when we talk about one of the three ministries of the diaconate, which is to teach and preach, uh, you really do a phenomenal job. And I'm not just saying that because we're friends, because we're on the air, it's just, it's the truth, 
It just is anybody who comes to your blog oh, thank will you. see it, right? Um, and then we have the work of 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 uh, at the altar, right? And then we have the works of charity. So you spoke about the sacramental work that you spoke, even baptism, which is the entree to the altar. So, so I guess what I'm really asking is in that last piece of the diaconate, which are the works of charity. Um, it, it, Talk to me about your journey in that piece of your diaconate. Um, One of the things that I've been blessed to be involved with, and this, uh, again, this was something Bishop DiMarzio instituted uh, for the deacons, and I found that there are a lot of deacons around the country who are involved in this ministry also, is uh, working with couples on annulments. Mm -hmm. And... Walking with them on that journey is is very moving and very humbling, and um, I, I, it's it's something that doesn't get nearly enough attention. And I think there are a lot of Catholics out there who poo poo the idea of the annulment process, but uh, I have seen so much transformation and so much grace from people who have gone through this process and who have taken the time and the effort and made the sacrifice to tell their life story and to, to look at their life in a very personal and introspective way. And there have been a number of couples where I've been privileged to witness their marriage after they've had the annulment finalized and they can get married in the church and being a part of that. In fact, I'm doing one of these weddings uh, May 1st uh, for uh, a couple that's been through the process. And they take it very seriously and it's it's really very moving to me uh, to see that and to see what grows out of that. Uh, I've, I've been very privileged to do that. I didn't realize you were in that ministry. That's tremendous. And that's true. That is ultimately uh, an act of love, charity. And my, my experience when I was pastor and even now in, in, in my role as bishop here, uh, that whole process of annulment is recognizing woundedness, it, there's grieving, and then there's healing. And yeah. it's not just a judicial act, it's really a, a, a pastoral journey, like you describe it. Um, sometimes people forget that, that that's really its, its purpose. And mm -hmm. one of the things that's been very striking is how often the, the stories repeat themselves. Um, so often people who their marriages end up breaking up, they come from broken marriages or there has been some kind of woundedness or some, some personal pain in their own parents or in their own life that they've somehow carried through uh, into the marriage and they weren't prepared for that. Um, you know, it's, it's above and beyond getting married for all the wrong reasons, which is common enough, but there are deeper problems that, uh, were buried within them that they, they hadn't quite recognized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to ask you a more open-ended question now, and you could, you could move on to the question after this one if you don't want to answer it. <laughs> Do you, Andrew, you, you, you have, a, I think, a, a really great sense of the church at large in part because of your studies and your writings and your travels and all the rest. So um, for the secular world out there that basically thinks that we're on our last legs, <laughs> that the church <laughs> is, is down and out, um, what would you say back to that secular world? And you're always very honest. So wh what would you say? Uh, how do you see this, the church in five, ten 15 years, whether it's globally or he, you know, in the metropolitan area, which we share, Bridgeport, Brooklyn, New York, we're all kind of in one big family here. Uh, take that question any way you like. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens when things really open up again uh, after the pandemic and after we're past this present crisis and see what, you know, what people do with this and see how many people end up coming back to church on a regular basis. The great challenge that we have, and I'm sure you know this better than anyone, is getting them to come back and stay back mm -hmm. and to encourage them to come back to what they were missing. Mm -hmm. There was a beautiful moment that we experienced on Christmas Eve 
uh, we didn't have the usual big midnight mass, but we did have a mass at 9 o'clock that night. And the turnout wasn't that great. We only got about 100 people. I think people were still very skittish and scared to come to church. But we had a beautiful scola. We didn't have a full choir, but we had a scola up in the choir loft. We had a beautiful liturgy. And after mass, the scola did sort of a medley of, of hymns slash carols. Silent Night and uh, Hark the Herald Angels Sing and, and so forth. And people who had started to leave the church came back in. And they didn't go and sit in the pews just to listen to the pretty music. They walked up to the crutch and they stood there looking at that scene and hearing that music. And there must have been 40 or 50 people just standing there looking at it. And I said to Bishop Sanchez, our pastor, Afterward, I said, as good as your homily was, that was better. Because these people, the people who walked in darkness had seen a great light. And they wanted to stay in that light. And they wanted to be a part of that. And they wanted to experience what they had been missing for all those weeks. They wanted the experience of community. They wanted the, the beauty and the wonder and the mystery. And the great challenge I think we have as a church is to remind people of that and to draw them back into that. So, um, and, but I've been overwhelmed since then, uh, particularly during the Easter season, the, the people who keep coming back and the, 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 the people in the pews were getting more and more of them, uh, who are incredibly faithful and incredibly committed to mm -hmm. our faith and really want to be a part of it and they've missed it. So mm -hmm. I think that's you know, the great challenge ahead of us. You know, I see this in, I see this as a great generational or pivotal moment for us, because, um, as you as you say, I think throughout society, the pandemic has forced people to question when they avoided the questions before, face some basic stark realities that they wanted to deny before, including the the frailty of our life and our common life. And, you know, you could all boil it down to who am I, where am I going, what's the purpose of all this, what, what does the future hold? And so I call it the second look. And I think mm. perhaps if we can become creative and imaginative and a little courageous and bold in our invitational ministries, people may respond in a way differently than before the pandemic occurred. They could be light even out of this awful experience of the darkness and the suffering and the death that was all around us. Um, I cling to that, very much hope. And here in the diocese, we're, form we're forming people, particularly for invitational ministry, um, which... Mm. You know, one day when we're off, off, off air, maybe we could chat about it because I would very much like to pick your brain about this as well. There's a communication piece to this too. It's not just the charisma, but it's intuiting how to preach it in a way where it can be effectively heard, which is a, an art form that, that you, some people are gifted with it and some people can learn it. But I, I think... To invite people, it has to be compelling. The truth is compelling, but it has to be said in such a way that they can actually hear it above all the noise and distraction in life, even in, in this time of the pandemic. Right. Mm -hmm. That was a beautiful story about Christmas. So, so certainly I will steal it for a homily down the road. So thank you for the information. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Great. Uh uh, on that, let's uh, let's take one more break here. Um, this is this is let me be frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Bishop Caggiano has been talking with the creator of the blog, the Deacon's Bench, Deacon Greg Kandra, uh, whose book, A Deacon Praise, comes out this month. We'll be right back. Why do we need Catholic radio? Because not everybody is sitting in front of a computer or watching their television set at home. How about when driving to work? How about while at work at your desk? Catholic Radio is there for you. I may be a Catholic priest, but I'm still a student of the faith. And Catholic Radio helps supply good material, whether it be a question and answer format show, whether it be a show itself on doctrine or theology. I myself, as a priest, am always learning. 
Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Uh, now's the time in the show where we take a listener question, and um, as Bishop Frank likes to say sometimes, let's see if we can stump the bishop. <laughs> is this, and this is a good one, uh, Excellency. So mm-hmm. I'm always so Im- never surprised, but always impressed by the quality of the audience that listens to you, Excellency. So here it is. It's from Dom, and he wrote, My class was talking about Ephesians 4, 6. It says, One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We concluded in class that the phrase, who is over all and through all and in all, means that in order for the second coming of Christ to happen, all people on earth need to come to know Jesus Christ and the victory of Good Friday. So when we evangelize and bring people to faith, is this to fulfill what it says there in Ephesians? Is this what people need to work towards? You know, I must confess, that is a unique interpretation of that section of Ephesians. Um, Because my understanding is our mission in the world is to effectively preach the gospel as best as we can right, with grace, in the power of grace. But that does not necessarily mean that everyone will accept the Lord, right, having, we fulfilling our duty and responsibility. So I, I personally have always understood that to be a, a, a statement of what will be when there is consummation of all things. That is, the Lord will be above all things, in all things. He, he will be Lord. He is now, but it will be clearly what is left will be under his dominion. But that does not mean everyone will be under his dominion. Does that make sense, the distinction? I think I get it, Excellency. You're, he's, he's the Lord of all, whether you believe it or not. And whether or not you accept it. Because right. if you're waiting for everyone to accept him, I'm not sure that day will come. Yeah. But that we preach it as best we can then when he comes is of his choice, of his choosing, a day unknown to us. But when he comes, all that is will be forever his because all that is not his will pass away. Hmm. (laughs) Okay, so if you're listening and you have questions for Bishop Frank, send them in. You can post them to social media or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. You can find Bishop Frank Caggiano on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Veritas Catholic Network is there as well. And you can also find our guest, Deacon Greg Kandra, on Facebook, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Especially, though, you can find him at thedeaconsbench.com, which is his blog, thedeaconsbench.com. Also, look for his new book, A Deacon Praise, published this month from Ave Maria Press. Deacon Kandra, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. It's been a joy. Thank you. And Deacon Cantor really has been, for me, it's a great blessing for us to connect again. And I look forward to another opportunity uh, off camera, off whatever this is, (laughs) so we can catch up. We We have a lot to catch up with. So thank you for spending the hour with me. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Deacon. And uh, Excellency, before we go, would you please give us your blessing? I'd be happy to. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, as we continue to walk in Easter joy, send your Holy Spirit upon ourselves and those whom we love, those whom we serve, to give joy to our hearts and strength to our spirits, that we may joyfully proclaim that Christ is risen, that Christ is truly risen. And we ask this as we ask all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We ask God's blessing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Steve, it was great to be with you. Deacon Kandra, my best to you, to Siobhan. I hope to see you again soon. Absolutely. Thank you. 